let's talk about what we mean by the coast when we use the term the coast. So if you fall asleep, and it's been a long week so far, um, these are the main things I want you to take away from this little chat here. Um, the, the generic thing that we will use for our class um, is when we just say the coast, unless we're giving you more specific uh, constraints or, or definitions, we mean the volume of the sea that's directly influenced by the land and the volume of the land that's directly influenced by the sea. That's our most generic thing. So if we're not specifying anything else, that's what we're going to use when we say coastal. Okay. So yes, it means the beach, but it's not necessarily what the general public always thinks about, right? So it includes that, but it also includes the grasslands, you know, in, in Thousand Oaks and the, and the coastal sage scrub and, and the Santa Monica Mountains and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. Um, a key aspect of how we define the coast in some of these other definitions, though, is tied to the so-called shoreline, which is where the water is going to meet the land, it was going to touch the land. And in particular, many of these definitions play off of what's known as mean higher high water. And the third most important takeaway point here is that there's no single definition of what is the coastal zone, right? Uh, many groups have, have their own definitions. It depends on what agency, what, what, what area you're in. But I would say all of them fall into, or just about all of them fall into one of these three broad categories. They're either a distance-based thing, so they're a distance from the mean higher high water line. They're an elevational thing, so it's the, it's the area up into the air or down into the water um, relative to that, that um, level of the shoreline. Or it's some political boundary and using some existing political construct like a city or like a county um, that people use to define the coast. So if you fall asleep, those are the key, those are the most important uh, things uh, to, to take away. Okay. Also, uh, uh, there are, you should realize, there are clear differences between people inland and people uh, at the coast. Um, and amongst other things, by the time we hit the 2020s, there are more people living just in our, on the immediate coastal fringe of our planet than existed in all of the Earth in the 1950s, right? So there's a lot, a lot of people here in this, in this relatively small uh, area. Um, something on the order of, and it depends on what definition we use, about, about a third to about 40% of the planet live um, in the coastal zone, and again, it's going to depend on how we define it, but roughly about only 10% of the land area of the Earth uh, falls into one of these coastal zones. So again, disproportionate concentration, disproportionate number of people, disproportionate amount of activity in the coastal zone relative to the rest of the terrestrial world, and, and, and marine world for that matter. And again, it's going to, the exact number is going to vary, but just the rule of thumb is, a, and that, that translates into about a billion-ish people in the immediate, immediate coastal fringe, right? It's more than that, but it's, but it's something like that for a rule of thumb. And the vast majority of, of that global population is in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. Um, we have, for the purposes, if we're talking about California policy, we have a very strict legal definition that is, has a lot of weird historical things, but, but our... Legally, when we talk about the coastal zone in California, we have a very specific definition that we'll talk about. Okay, does that make sense? So those are the takeaways. So if you fall asleep, make sure you know that stuff. Okay, so um, to start with, uh, our largest concentrations of humans, so our largest urban areas, are at the coast. Doesn't matter if we're talking about London, doesn't matter if we're talking about Miami. Um, that is, uh, there are some large cities inland in places like Chicago, but for the most part, um, uh, our largest cities, when we look around the world, are, are clustered around the edges of uh, the land touching water. I guess for that matter, Chicago is on the Great Lake, but um, the density of people is greatest at the coast, and um, the the, the activity that goes on there, so the so-called seaboards, or the, which is sort of a, a loose term um, uh, 
that, that, that people like in policy and, and stuff use, um, meaning, meaning the area next to the coast, which is what you might call the, sort of the coastal zone. Um, uh, that's where we have the greatest concentration of economic activity and, the great, and, the, and our most important, uh, on average, social institutions and things like that. Um, and this is where the idea of coastal elite partly comes from, right? That we have all the folks with all the big universities, the big investors, the big, the big uh, you know, all that stuff is concentrated in places like New York City and Boston and Seattle and things like that. And it's less concentrated, you know, inland elsewhere in Washington State or elsewhere in New York or whatever. And when we add all this together, it amounts to very distinct uh, patterns of, of human behavior at the coast versus um, other uh, inland parts. Um, as I mentioned, uh, more people live at the coast today than were alive in all, on, on the entirety of the earth in the wake of World War II. That's about a billion people, roughly, overall. And uh, our coastal population is large. So in 2010, it was about 123 million people lived in, um, using a political definition, which is easy because you can just grab those numbers really, really, really quickly um, from the U.S. Census. So if we, just, if we just say, hey, counties that touch the ocean, if we just add that up, that's 123 million people, um, you know, more than a decade ago. Now that same number is up to about 134 million people uh, just in the U.S. alone. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in, in San Francisco, I grew up in the, in the Bay Area, uh, and uh, it was always this Northern California, Southern California thing. So when I was young, uh, we had like some big droughts and things, and then, and then there would be these calls for, hey, you guys, let's, let's save water. And so like we did, all our neighbors would do things like put bricks in the tank, uh, in, like the, the um, toilet tank behind the, behind the seat to take up volume so you wouldn't, so the tank wouldn't fill up with as much water and just all these things, right? And it was everybody was always, how do, how do we save water? How do we save water? And so, you know, once a month or so, they'd, they'd post a, um, they, they'd sort of say, hey, how well are we doing with water conservation? We've reduced water consumption by X percent. And it was always, like, where I was from, it was always like 13%, 20% reduction, et cetera. And they'd show like LA and it'd be like 1% or like half a percent or something. It'd be like, what? And so this narrative really grew up where I was from, where it was this sort of north versus south, where it's always, oh, those SoCal people with all their sunglasses and movie stars and those SoCal people, right? It's always like shaking your finger. And so there really has become, and in fact, at one point, at one, at one point I, in my freshman dorm, I lived in this tall dorm and uh, on the ninth floor, so I would take the elevator a lot, and the door opened up, and I walked out, and there was some, these two guys sitting on a couch. I think they were probably stoned, but regardless. And they were like, and I was talking to my friend, and we were saying some stuff, and these guys said, shoot, stop, 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 stop. I was like, what? I said, don't say anything else. I said, okay, what? And they said, um, uh, are you from uh, Northern California or Southern California? And and so then I said, and then my friend said, and then one guy like clapped his hands and went, woo! The other guy went, ah! And they were having a bet based on the phrases that people said they could predict if they're from Northern California or Southern California. And so uh, I used to say things like hella a lot, and now I say dude a lot. Because I grew up in Northern California, but now I live in Southern California. So the Southern California lingo has, has taken over my speech. Anyway, but that was always the talk. The talk was always North versus South, North versus South, North versus South. That is, and so it was, and you know, looks something like this. It's not exactly a, a middle of the state, but it's really essentially Point Conception and South, sort of the South Coast, the, the greater LA area, basically. That was always what we're, was talked about. Um, the reality is this. This is really how our state is divided. It's coastal versus inland. And even though this NorCal SoCal thing is, you can get sweatshirts and things like that, it really is not that real. The people in Northern California are much more like the people in Southern California if we talk about the coastal zone, and the same if we talk about inland. Um, and so uh, let's start. So for example, the majority of the voters, the voting population is right at the coast in our state. And it, we don't even need to look at the specific things here. These are just the outcomes of various um, uh, polling and voting and voting things. Again, just look at the colors. The colors at the coast are generally speaking one shade 
and the colors inland are another shade, indicating the amount of support of these various topics, behaviors, all that kind of stuff. Um, same with housing, um, uh, COVID vaccination rates, and this isn't just a California phenomenon, this is a, this is a you know, anywhere phenomenon kind of thing. So same thing, where, where are the most uh, testing labs? Where the, is the uh, highest social distancing, right? There, there's, there are all these things, there are clear differences in terms of um, everything. Um, vaccination rates, it goes on and on and on. And so it used to be uh, the majority of the population in our state was in what we would call Northern California. Um, San Francisco was the big cultural epicenter where the operas were and that kind of stuff. Sacramento, where the political powerhouse was. Monterey, our original political um, uh, center of power when Spain and then Mexico were ruled California, right? All that stuff, all of those political powerhouses and things were all Northern California. As we move into the 1900s, the population begins to shift and Southern California grows, particularly as we enter into the World War II era and, and we see that growing and we pretty much stabilized at that level. So even though the Southern California that on our map, it's a relatively smaller area in terms of uh, stuff, um, uh, more, the, the population base has moved to Southern California. But if we, oh yeah, Jordy. I just had a quick question. Sure. Regarding, sorry, regarding like the stabilized, with increasing the coastal problem, like conversion, do you see increased, do you see the inland or the? Excellent question. Excellent, so, so, so shift totally, excellent. So, so, so the question was, hey, with things like sea level rise or these other issues or the erosion of Palos Verdes Peninsula or you know, whatever these things, Big Sur, landslides, um, are people going to abandon the coast? And that's actually one of the things we'll be addressing with our, our opinion poll surveys. So we'll, you actually be able to answer that exact question. And we have data from previous years, so you can look at what the trend is. Long story short, not really. So, so there definitely are people that are bailing, but there's also people that are coming in. So, and, and, and whatever difference there is, it's very small. It's like, so it makes national news when California, the overall California population stops growing. So we've stopped growing. We actually shrunk a little bit in the immediate wake of the pandemic. And everybody's like, oh my God, California's shrinking. It's like tens of thousands of people, you know. And to be sure, that's, that's a different thing that, because we've always been growing for every year since basically we became a state. So those are important shifts. But if you just read the headlines, you get the impression that maybe a lot of people are bailing. No. Um, so there's still people here. So I don't, I don't see a massive shift. But again, we'll see. But, but remember, there's also wildfires and stuff inland and all those other climate challenges as well and drought and stuff. Okay, so great question. Okay, so this is the, the old perception of north versus south. This is the reality, right? So the reality is, and, and so if we took this like, oh yeah, there's kind of sort of close to, you know, 50-50, maybe it's like 60-ish, but you know, kind of close to evenly broken down. But it really, if we talk about the big differences, it's where are the number of people inland versus at the coast. And there it's super, super clear. So we're talking like 70 to 80 percent of the population is at the coast. That's really where, where all the power is, that's where all the money is, all the investments, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's us. Let's talk about some of the definitions as to how we, how we define the coastal zone. And so there's, there's always um, uh, uh, challenges here whenever we draw a line in something that's, that's, that's often dynamic, but we need to draw lines to, to get stuff going on. Um, uh, the coastal zone is an important area, and so for all these reasons, for planning, for, for the, like Jordy's question about, hey, how many people are moving in here? We need to have a clear line. Okay, what do we mean by the coast versus inland? And so here's a classic example, right? So, so you know, where would we draw the line? Okay, maybe we, we could theoretically draw the line where the water is or where the wet sand is. We could draw the line maybe um, where the top of the cliff is. We could draw the line at the top of the hill. There's, there's many possible places, right? As we look at these processes, we see these processes um, can, can blur the line. So for example, um, right over here, uh, uh, on the right, we can see some of these terrestrial dust storms that are blasting off the land and they're essentially throwing fertilizer or throwing sediment into the water, 
right? So sometimes there's no wind, and so there's maybe no sediment going in. Other times it's really, really hollow, and, and that, that terrestrial input can be going really far away. This is also something that people have recognized for a long time. So this, this guy on the right is this um, uh, illustration from a Japanese artist, but basically looking at the same place at different times, it can appear different, right? So, so these are dynamic systems, it's important to say. Okay, the coastal zone, as with most of the things in the real world, is three-dimensional, but for most of our planning purposes, we, we tend to think of it as just looking down on a map. So we tend to think of it as a two-dimensional space. Um, uh, yeah, okay, right. So our general air, our, this is our general term, right? The stuff that, that, that's directly influencing stuff. And we say directly influencing, typically what we mean by that is, is a strong material or energetic input, right? Um, so, so like sand blowing off, water flowing into, uh, uh, that kind of stuff. Birds flying onto the land, pooping and dropping fertilizer from the, the crustaceans they just ate, that kind of stuff. Okay, let's talk about the shoreline. So the shoreline is sometimes called the waterline. And so let's look, start by looking on the left side over here. Okay, so this is a, a measure of our tides. And if you've taken Dr. Patch's physical oceanography class, this is probably familiar to you. But suffice it to say, what we're doing here, this, this um, graph is showing you um, uh, a, a time plot. So on the x-axis, it's, it's hours in the day. On the y-axis, it's the height of the water. So imagine we went and we just took a ruler and jammed it in the sand and then every you know, five minutes we went out and measured what, what, you know, at what point on the ruler is it, right? So we tracked. So what we, this top one is called a semi-diurnal tide. And as we look at that, the water goes, you know, at some, some hours it's going up, some hours it's going down. Some hours it's going up, some hours it's going down. We're all familiar with this with the rising tides and things of that nature, right? Okay, and on this, this one on top, the, the peaks of the, the high water, they might be a little bit different, but roughly they're, they're pretty similar, right? They're pretty similar heights, uh, depending which peak, which peak we look at. And the troughs, the bottom, is generally pretty similar, okay? The one in the middle is called a mixed tide. And so that is a case where the highs are pretty significantly different, you know, from one to the other and the lows or the troughs are potentially significantly different from one day to another, or, 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 or from one, one round to another, right? Um, uh, if things were, we do have some places where, um, where we have just one high tide and just one low tide a day. That, they're not super common, but they do exist. So these are all the different flavors of that. What we have on our, um, in our, part of the world and much of the world is called a mixed semi-diurnal tide. So we have basically this mixed, this mixed situation right here. Regardless, doesn't matter if we're talking about a, di a, a, a diurnal tide or whatever, notice that there's always some high water, right? And there's always some low water. And so, so this is the guy that we're talking about. And so how we calculate that is literally people have gone out and jammed rulers into the sand and measured for a long period of time. So one of my friends has gone down to the stairway uh, in, in Carpinteria, I think it is, and, and just about every day measured the water relative to the rocks there. So, because he's like a nerdy dude. Um, but back in the day, that's what we did. So we actually employed people in things like coastal surveys to just do that. So back in the day, we did this all by hand. Now we mostly use autonomous instruments, either data loggers or satellites to get at this, but it's the same idea. The idea is go out and record exactly how high the water is, you know, uh, uh, every few minutes or so. And if we do that, um, what we can do is we can, we can see the, the height. And obviously some days, depending on the, how the moon and sun is, um, some high, tides are higher than others, some are lower than others. But what we can do is we can take all of these high water marks, so the part where the ocean is the highest, and we can average those. And that's how we calculate the so-called mean higher high water line. And so in most cases, uh, 
how we typically define the shoreline is that mean high or high water line. So by doing this for many, many days, many, many months, and then averaging them together, that's where we're talking, right? Because otherwise, you, and, and there's no reason why we had to do mean high or high water. We could have done the low water mark. We could have done the midpoint, but we just had to pick something. And so for the sake of just picking something, we picked the mean high or high water. And that's, and that's what we use to define the shoreline. Does that make sense? Okay, so then once we have that, now that we have our, our, our mean high or high water line drawn on a map, now we can start to do some calculations. And again, because most of our definitions with the coastal zone are about distances on a two-dimensional thing, now we have a line, we can measure things from that line. So, for example, uh, distance-based definitions, um, and, all, and these different definitions have value in different contexts. So in the case of the distance-based um, uh, definitions, often that's about dealing with pressures uh, and stressors, right? So, so for example, um, housing supply, or how much, how many fishing vessels are, are concentrated, how close to the, the shore, right? Like those, those squid fishermen off Malibu, for example. So, so those would be distance-based measures. Ele Elevation-based measures are usually best when we're talking about a hazard, a potential risk. So think about this as looking at maybe the storm surge from a hurricane or long-term planning for sea level rise, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the political boundary based definition. So in most, one of the easiest ones in the sense here is does that county or does that city touch the shoreline? Um, these are really helpful because many of our data sources especially demographic, economic, et cetera, are already binned by political area, right? By, by, by an arbitrary political unit. Might be a zip code, might be a city border, might be a county border. So it's relatively easy to find those, those, de, those, that information relatively quickly. And so these things are really helpful um, for uh, you know, rapid assessment and they're really, really helpful, especially before we had GIS. Now that we have GIS and we have some more granularity to our data, we can actually reconstruct some of these things, but especially in a pre-GIS world, which is where most of our policies and stuff, uh, w when they were generated, uh, this was a really easy way of sort of getting at some of the geospatial stuff without having you know, robust geospatial tools. Okay, so some common, some common measures for how we define the coastal zone worldwide include these. So one is a low elevation coastal zone, and this is, the, this is defined as an area of land. So again, this is, this, is not, this is only the part of the coastal zone that's on the terrestrial side of the equation, but still. It's the land area contiguous with the coastline and is less than or equal to 10 meters in elevation. So less than 33 feet above, above average mean high, higher water. Uh, another one that's used is a buffer. And so I, in recent years, I'm seeing more diversity here. Historically, it was always a 100 kilometer buffer that was the most popular one, but I see people use sometimes um, um, 50 and, and 200 uh, kilometer buffer. Um, these are usually helpful when we're talking about large scale patterns like countries, shipping outputs and, and, and investments in infrastructure and things of that nature. So the 100 kilometer buffer is, is pretty um, popular. Um, I'd also say in recent years, the 10 kilometer buffer has become pretty popular. Um, and that would be what we might call the immediate coastal zone. So not the full hardcore coastal zone, but, but just the, the stuff closest to the edge. And this is really uh, useful when people talk about um, uh, uh, things that we most closely associate with the coast, things like beaches and, and harbors and ports and things of that nature. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I had population density out there. That should, that, uh, but, but I, th I think, I think that the, the, this dot, I screwed up, so this dot shouldn't, been have called out, shouldn't have been called out. So, so this is, the 10 kilometer buffer is usually really helpful when we talk about pressures and impacts. Um, so this example should go with a 10 kilometer one. Um, and then another one that we see sometimes, especially in developmental indexes or, or sustainable development uh, um, fields, is this notion of the percentage or the proportion of the coastal population in, in coastal urban areas. So cities that touch the, the, uh, the coast. Um, 
And uh, this is also frequently used when we talk about um, armoring the coastline and things of that nature. Okay. Um, the most popular ones in the U.S. are going to be a county based by far. So is it a coastal county? If it is, then it counts as the coastal zone. And there's two flavors of that. The most common one would just be the coastal shoreline counties. That would be a county that touches the, wa the ocean water. And then because of lobbying, many of the Great Lakes people are considered, like according to, according to National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the Great Lakes are freshwater lakes, but NOAA is involved with those guys too. And, the, and they're considered a shoreline, even though they're... They're not seawater. Um, and that, again, there's, there's a reason for that. But suffice it to say, so, okay, so you, your county touches the water. And then another one that's used less commonly is a coastal watershed county. So this is where a watershed that drains directly into the um, sea uh, is, is the thing. It's, and, and that's a much larger, because you can imagine, you can, for us, let's talk about the coastal shoreline counties that would be like Ventura County, Los Angeles County, Santa Barbara County, right? That kind of stuff. But if we're talking about the coastal watershed county, where does our water come from in Ventura? Well, yeah, it comes from here, but you know, we also have stuff coming in from Kern County and elsewhere. And so then, so the Kern County and those other inland counties would get subsumed if we were talking about coastal watershed counties. Ultimately, the vast majority of our water supplies flow into the ocean. So it gets, you know, there's, there's some issues with that, but, but suffice to say that those are things that are used. Mostly it's coastal shoreline counties. Um, we can talk about uh, inland sea versus ocean. So we, we sometimes will talk about oceanic shores, meaning just the counties that touch or, or just the areas that touch the salt water. And that would be in contrast to when we have things that are inclusive of the Great Lakes. And generally speaking, I'd say most sort of academic studies focus on oceanic shores but for political reasons, because we've made the bargain, um, if we're talking about like national policy, they'll often include uh, the Great Lakes in, in the shorelines of the, of the U.S. And then, uh, those are sort of objective, sort of we can reconstruct those at any time uh, uh, measures. Then we have arbitrary definitions, and these are going to vary by place and time. So the classic would be our own California Coastal Act that has a very arbitrary definition of what is the coastal zone, what is not. Um, and then we'll get, we, we've also seen a lot of this burble up in the context of sea level rise planning. So a lot of the groups that I've been associated with, when we start making the maps, like, well, where are we going to draw the line? And we just sort of make an arbitrary line. So, so there are a fair number of arbitrary dif uh, definitions that vary um, based on where we are in the U.S. Um, so having said this, expose you guys to all these different uh, definitions. It's true. There's, var there's various definitions. But they do matter, and how we def what, what definition we pick is going to change our output or our outcome. And so, for example, here are some of the coastal shoreline counties in blue, and then if we add those coastal watershed counties, you know, it's potentially a lot more land uh, uh, that we're talking about. Um, and so, let's look at a couple examples of, of the different application of, is this making sense? Any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about a couple examples where people have used these different definitions in sort of their outputs. So here is an analysis um, from the 2010 U.S. Sentence, uh, census, excuse me. And so these guys report that only 254 of our more than 3,000 counties um, touch salt water, but even though that's only 8% of the total number of counties, or if we're talking about the, the aerial extent of these counties, only 16% of the, of the county areas in the U.S., they have about a third of the, they have 29% of the people, and they have half of our most populous cities and 70% of our most populous counties. Um, okay, let's talk about our bureaucracy here in California as one of those examples of an arbitrary definition of a coastal zone. So um, it, it started, so the we have our California Coastal Commission, which we'll talk more about later uh, in, our, in our, our course uh, and several times in our course. But really, the, the, the creation of this California Coastal Commission was really at the heart of our current, uh, uh, what you might call, arbitrary definition. 
Um, uh, there's some readings you guys will do on this. Uh, I can't remember if they had them this week or next week, but, but there's some readings that you will do if, if you haven't done them yet um, about this. And essentially what was going on was um, two big fears. Um, there uh, is a place called Sea Ranch up north of San Francisco, and there's a place called Malibu. Both those two places were getting developed rapidly. Um, in, the 19, in the wake of the World War II, so going on in the 60s, and people were getting worried that it was looking like now it was starting to become a place, not for everybody, but a place for some people. And people were worried. So there was di different movements that sort of burgeoned up to try to protect access and, and, and that kind of stuff. And people recognized, even back then, that there's something different, something more challenging going on at the immediate coastal zone versus inland that maybe some of our existing policy tools were not uh, maybe didn't seem up to the task. And so all that went into the creation of the Coastal Act. Now, initially, people said, hey, can you guys do something about this legislature? And the legislature's like, nah, right? And so then the people got ticked off. So the people um, uh, started a, a movement that led to um, a ballot initiative and the ballot initiative said, hey, we want to create um, essentially what, what would amount to the California Coastal Commission and some particular governance and things around the immediate coastline. Um, and that passes. And that freaks out the legislature. So now, now they're starting to have like, significant potential policy implications done by the ballot. So then, then the legislature's like, oh, when we said no, no, what we actually meant is yes, we're, we'll do it ourselves. So then they created a law that superseded that initial proposition. And in addition to just creating a law, they also modified our state constitution, which is a very hard bar. You have to have, it's, it's a very difficult lift. Um, and we did that. And so the California Coastal Act, which is our, 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 our central governing document for the coastal zone here in California, passes in 1976, modifies our constitution. And there's, and there's various tweaks that have happened over the years, but, but that's the big story. So as we're going into this, obviously we needed a definition because we're going to have some rules, which we don't care about those rules at this exact moment, but, but we have some rules. We need to figure out if the rules apply to you or to me. So we needed some type of measure. And so um, we already had something called the California, or sorry, yeah, well, yeah, I'll just say a lot of this is built around development worries, which more on that later. Okay, so, so as this is happening, we already have this issue in San Francisco. That's that little video I, you watched um, about uh, um, the, trying to chop off San Bruno Mountain and throw it into San Francisco Bay. So we have a thing that grows up called the San Francisco Bay uh, Conservation and Development um, Com Commission that is gonna regulate the coastline inside the Bay of San Francisco. So all the counties that, that touch the San Francisco Bay. So that was already in existence. So uh, we created, um, so then in the wake of that, we create the California, um, uh, 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 the, the definition and the Coastal Commission. But let me also say before I go in the next part, because this causes confusion. So I'm talking, we're talking about the California Coastal um, Commission. That's different from the California Coastal Conservancy. They're both state entities, they're both state organizations, but they have different mandates. The Conservancy is mostly interested in protecting resources, restoring stuff, parks, that kind of jazz. The Coastal Commission is the entity that's gonna regulate development and have all this influence on access and that kind of stuff. So, so even though we're not gonna talk about that right now, I, I just wanna make sure you guys understand. So the definition we're looking for um, in this bureaucracy is, is the one that's going to govern the um, Coastal Commission's things and things regulated by the California Coast Light. Okay, so here we go. Here's our California. And you notice there's a, there's a gray zone here and a pink zone here. The gray zone is the oceanward coastal zone. The pink is the landward coastal zone. So that's what, and if we just stare at it from afar, you guys can probably see it's not an even... It's, it's not like a buffer, right? It's not, not like we just took like a one kilometer or a 10 kilometer or something buffer up and down the coast, right? Some areas way more pink. Some areas we can barely see the pink. Yeah? Okay. Um, there's, I'll just say there's also simultaneously to this or just leading up to this, there's also a debate as to who owns the underwater side of the coastal zone. And... Um, 
and there's there's some there's some definitions back and forth. The original definition for what is what is our ocean what is our country's ocean waters was um, uh, three nautical miles. Why three nautical miles? Because back in the day, that's how big we could build a cannon. And so people figured out that if we made a big honking gigantor cannon and fired it, we could throw, uh, you know, in late mid 1800s, late 1800s, we could throw a cannonball about three miles. So in other words, if some bad guy came in to start fishing, we could say, get the hell out of here. We could, we could shoot them, right? Beyond that, we couldn't necessarily easily influence people's movement from land. And so historically, what were the waters of a country? They were very, very tight into the land. Some things go on, well, more on this later, but some things go on, and suffice it to say, um, uh, we, we um, uh, basically get to this, this some, some definitions as to what is federal, what is, what is um, state land, and so, so this was going on underwater just like it's going on land, uh, the, the, the sort of evolution. Um, now, when we were creating the coastal zone, the definition of the coastal zone, this was before we had GIS, like, like you guys use GIS, right? So it was very much paper maps, drawing on paper maps. Um, and the, the consensus came to a distance-based measure from the shoreline, from the mean high or high water. And... Um, to see, it would be three nautical miles is our definition of a coastline, or a, a, a state, excuse me, state coastal waters in, um, whose activities are influenced by the Coastal Act. Landward, though, it's not just a thing. Landward, it's variable. So in some areas, it's only a tenth of a mile from the mean high or high water. In other areas, it extends as far inland as five miles, right? 100% totally backroom politics, no question. So some people said, I don't want it, to, I want it to be farther. Other people said, I want it to be less, and, and they just fought, basically. Um, generally speaking, they started off with five miles inland as our coastal zone, unless people push back. And so what we see is the less politically uh, empowered area, the less densely populated areas, the coastal zone there extends five miles inland. The power centers, especially urban areas, cities where there's lots of people, they were like, uh-uh, we don't want you telling us what to do. We want to minimize your influence as much as possible. So in those areas, it's, up, it's usually only a tenth of a mile. So if we're in the Santa Monica Mountains, it's going to go five miles inland, right? So, so depending on where we are, maybe even into the valley or you know, close to the valley, so the, to the ridge line or past the ridge line on the Santa Monica Mountains is the coastal zone. So the Coast Commission has influence if you want to put a house or whatever in that area. If we go to Santa Monica, it's only going to go a tenth of a mile. So if we pick up a rock and throw it from the beach inland, it might, it might land outside the coastal zone, right? And so that's just, that's just what we have. That's just what we have. The last thing to say about the definition, or not the last thing, but, but the last sort of starter thing to say about the Coastal Commission and, the, and our coastal zone is it excludes all of this, the internal part of the San Francisco Bay because that Bay Commission existed before we created the Coastal Act, so we just ignored that. So, so that has its own set of rules. So the California Coastal Zone does not include any of the immediate land inside the, the um, San Francisco Bay Area from a political policy standpoint. Okay, and so this is what it looks like in our neck of the woods. So again, in the Santa Monica Mountains, the pink zone is really, really thick. In the urban, urban Los Angeles, it's very, very thin and narrow. In places like the Oxnard Plain, it's a little bit in between. It's, it's not as narrow as it is in LA, but it's definitely not the full five miles. And you must look at a map. There is no, so I've just described the general pattern to you, but if you are in the coastal zone or not, you need to go and look at the specific map to see if your property or, or the area in question is uh, inside the coastal zone or not inside the coastal zone. Again, the blue line is the coastal zone, et cetera. Okay, that's California, yeah, Carson. 
Uh, we're just outside. Just outside. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So that's California. Let's talk about some other examples from some other jurisdictions around, uh, around the country. So if we talk about Louisiana, and so again, we sometimes, because we're so big, because this is where we live, we tend to see the world through a California lens, which is fine, but just realize that it's very different depending on where we are elsewhere um, in the world or elsewhere in our country. So let's take the example of Louisiana. So Louisiana uh, has their, uh, they uh, craft their, their policy and, and legal conception of the coastal zone based on what's called the Louisiana Coastal Management Program, which has been in effect since 1980. Um, and there it's, it's run through one of their state offices, uh, state agencies, specifically the Office of Coastal Management. Um, and just for a note, as we go on, sometimes I abbreviate management like that, right, just for space on slides. So if you guys see that, that that's a shorthand for management. Um, and their definition of a coastal zone is much broader than ours in terms of the, the how far inland does it go. So there, the, the, everything within 16 miles of the, co of the shoreline is within the coastal zone. And sometimes it extends twice that far inland. And, and this is a huge area, massive area. This, this coastal zone, just in Louisiana alone, is accounting for about 40% of the nation's coastal wetlands in the lower 48 states. So huge, huge area just in this one, um, one state. Okay, let's look at another, let's look at North Carolina. So North Carolina, theirs, their definition was first codified in 1978 under what's called the North Carolina Coastal Management Program. And again, it's another uh, state agency that's, that's running it. Um, and, uh, and their coastal zone um, is defined as the 20 counties that in whole or in part touch the Atlantic Ocean or any coastal sound. Coastal sound would be like an embayment um, uh, coming in. And they, um, for management purposes, they have two tiers. They have two main flavors of a coastal zone. One is an area of environmental concern, and that would be stuff that we most immediately associate with a coast. So uh, an estuary, a dune, a dune system, beach, that kind of stuff. That would be an, an AEC. And then there's areas that are, that uh, are within that zone, but aren't, the, aren't, aren't those things, but areas that might impact those things. So those are potential areas potentially impacting the AECs. Okay, um, and so here's a look at our coastal counties here in the U.S. These, again, these are all the counties that uh, touch the coast. And for administrative purposes, we oftentimes at a national policy level tend to talk about these um, systems based on the geographies that tend to behave the same. So on the west coast, we have a very steep up-down coast. So we don't have, you know, so if I take my, I take my rock and, I throw, and I'm at, at the beach and I throw my rock, um, like say here at, at uh, um, Point Magoo, and it's going to hit the water, plink, it's going to sink, and maybe it's and at, at uh, Point Magoo, maybe it's going to sink, I don't know, 100 feet of water, something like that, right? If I'm over here in the green, if I'm over here on the East Coast and I go to that same beach, pick up my rock, throw it, plink, same distance, same size rock, whatever, plinks, it's going to sink maybe, I don't know, five feet in the water, you know, 10 feet in the water, something like that. So it's a much, much shallower area. We, on the West, dominated mostly by, we have, although Southern California, we have a lot of sandy beaches. For the most part, as a region, rocky. We're very young geologically. We're very up-down, you know, uh, 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 very steep coastlines. East Coast, very eroded. They don't really have mountains like we have mountains, right? It's very flat. So it's very, so that water, so, so the land water transition is very um, gradual. It also means that for us, we have, we don't have as many, for example, coastal wetlands because there's like, it mostly exists in little pockets here and there. Whereas in places like the East Coast, you have broad swaths where the, where the wetlands maybe extend for miles and miles and miles out to the horizon kind of thing. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico is similar to the Atlantic seaboard um, uh, in that it's very flat. Um, but there we also, but we're, whereas this tends to be very sandy on the, on the green, this tends to be more muddy in, the, in the, the purple region because we have things like the Mississippi 
that are dumping in there. And we have a different circulation pattern um, in the Caribbean. Um, so, so anyway, so we, we tend to talk about coastal counties in these sort of broad uh, geographic areas. Um, and we'll just end with looking at a, a last little quick run through here of some examples of data as to why this stuff matters. And so we can maybe ask the question, hey, which coastal counties grew the most in the last you know, many decades? And so, um, so sometimes I have you guys do an exercise, but I wanna, I wanna talk about our, our Manta data uh, today. But, but basically you could, you could do this in terms of numbers and proportions, and, uh, and uh, we can do this with a viewer that I'll, I'll share with you guys. Um, and so, for example, we can look and see, okay, if we talk about number um, between 1960 and 2008, when this particular data table was spit out, LA um, has the greatest change, right? The greatest number of people at, great gross total number of humans added to this coastal county, right? However, we talk about proportion, a lot, and, and oh, sorry, let's just go up there. So let's look at the top numbers for like, you know, 50 years or so. Let's see, so that county is California, then Texas, then California, California, Florida, Florida, California, Florida, Washington, New York, Florida, Florida. So there's a lot of California in there and a lot of West Coast kind of stuff for numbers. If we talk about proportions of change, we see it's a lot of Florida, 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 Florida. It's almost all Florida, 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 or a lot of Florida, 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 right? And so that's gonna be key. So remember when we're looking at comparisons as we go across the semester, really make sure, uh, so and both of these are valid. It's totally valid to talk about the relative change, the proportional change. It's also totally valid to talk about the quantity. But it's just important that you guys really do remember that, uh, that when you're articulating this, you say, oh, but blah, blah, blah is more. Talk about your data source. So is my data source the total number or is it a proportional you know, relative measure? Um, both have value depending on what context we're talking about. Okay, um, so to wrap up, I'll just say that our coast is increasingly urbanized, regardless of if it's proportion or number of people, more and more people are moving to the coast. Um, and it l produces things like these crazy um, efforts to develop things in funky ways. Our coast has been urbanized for some time, right? So this is Huntington Beach. Everything you're seeing out here, these are all oil derricks right on the, right on the beach, right? Um, and, and so it's not as if we just started urbanizing our coast. This is, this is a long going thing. It's just that the intensity of the urbanization is continuing. Um, and so, um, yeah, yeah, I'll just say that we're more and more urbanized. Um, and it's also not just us in the U S so this is, um, we can look at population density, um, using some different, uh, mapping tools. And if we overlay the, the coastal zone on there, um, using a distance buffer, using a 200 kilometer buffer, this is what we see. So, so this is, uh, this is, you know, 14 years ago now, but it's, it's still, the general trend is still there. So again, the darker color, the more uh, dense the population is, the lighter color, the less dense. And what we see is um, there's variation here, but the greatest concentration of people in the coastal zone is definitely in Southeast Asia, right? So that's where these big population centers are. Southeast Asia is like our Gulf Coast or our um, East Coast, and then it's a very, very flat coast. Very, very flat coast. Just like we have the, the Mississippi, they have many big rivers like Mekong and all these other uh, Yellow River, all these, these huge rivers uh, bringing sediment in. So they have a very flat and very um, non-rocky coastline as a, as a whole, and that's where these folks are living. So this is a huge challenge because as we're seeing more sea level rise, more natural disasters, hurricanes, typhoons, all these things coming on in, you have these people living a much higher portion of people right at the coastline and not um, super well protected. Okay, and then there's an ex some exploration we can start doing, but, but I'll just uh, end with this little quick animation. So rather than have you guys go do it yourself, I'll just step through it real quickly for you. So this is one of our climate viewers, and this is the number of people um, uh, living uh, in, in the very, very immediate coast zone. So in this case, using an elevational model. And so this is the, the number of folks that are within one, uh, that live within one foot elevation of mean higher high water, right? So here we'll start, we'll start step. So if we just use that definition, it's mostly people concentrated in the Bay Area, San Mateo counties. As we start to change this three feet, doesn't change that much, doesn't change that much. Ooh, it's starting to change a little bit now that we hit five feet, 
right? So San Mateo is still super vulnerable, so it's, it's, it's much more like sort of Southeast Asia in that, in that sense, with a lot of people living very close to the waterline. As we keep going, oh, we start getting more people. Now we start getting our Southern California groups coming on in, um, eight feet, nine feet. Now we're getting, have a look, coastal zone, but look what's happening here. The, the risk is spreading inland, particularly amongst the delta, right? Particularly with all those levees that we've constructed to keep the water out. Once that water level gets high, people, they, they might be overtopped. So, so even though we don't typically think of that area, you know, say more towards Sacramento as immediate coastal zone, with coastal flooding, they could be, in sea level rise, they could be strongly impacted. And in, in fact, more so than people say like in Big Sur or places like that. Okay. So that's nine feet, 10 feet. I guess 10 feet was the highest one I wrote. So, um, so the risk changes depending on, on how we do that. And so again, the definitions matter in terms of these things. Um, the UN, which generates a lot of our sort of global predictions in terms of vulnerability and hazards and things like that, um, they typically uh, use uh, distance and elevational data when they wanna talk about pressures and vulnerability. For, for different countries or different areas. Um, the, the big one that came along, uh, we're, we're into a different era now, but the, but the big change in the UN, a sort of a sea change of how we approach stuff was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that came out in the early 2000s. And they shifted and they started to uh, use the definition of, of um, less than 50, or excuse me, less than 100 kilometers from the mean high or high water and 50 meters uh, and, and less than 50 meters elevation. Um, and yeah, I'll just say that. So, so, so these definitions are important. I'll end with just recapping, saying again, with the definition of the coast, um, our most populous cities are right at the coast. Um, uh, the greatest density of people are at the coast. Um, we have intense concentration of this, these different activities right, right at the coast. Um, and we have very distinct demographics. So voting behavior, educational attainment, average household income, all these things vary most predictably if we're at the coast versus if we're inland. So if you only, only could know one thing about a, a geographic area, I'd ask, is it next to the coast or not next to the coast? Um, our, our generic definition, again, is the part of the land that's directly influenced by the sea, and the part of the sea is directly influenced by the land, unless we specify something else. Um, the things that are more specified are usually tied to the shoreline, and most commonly that's defined by uh, where the mean high or high water is. Um, and we don't have a single definition, but we have distance-based, elevation, and uh, base measures, and the political boundaries, which often have to do with touching the shoreline. Um, and we mentioned before that about um, the same number of people that were alive in the 1950s are now alive just in our immediate coastal zone. Um, alive on the whole planet or just now in the coastal zone. That's something like 30 to 40 percent of all of us, even though it's only about 10 percent of land. That's about, a, you know, numbers wise, that's more than a billion people. And um, uh, most recently, it's about 40 percent um, of, uh, of people are, of our country's population is within these shoreline counties. And we have that funky definition, which we'll talk more about later, but, but our funky definition, including for us, the California coastal zone defined by the Coastal Act. And that's it.